Recently, I sent out an email to my list asking people to ask me anything, meaning you could fill out a form and ask me any question that you want, and I may cover that question on an upcoming video on this channel. And many of you gave me really great responses on that form. And one of those questions was, do I have any regrets about pursuing a career in music? And this question really struck me because it's quite an interesting topic. Um, and I really had to kind of think about how I would approach answering it on this video. And um, because it really forces me to kind of take a look at, you know, my career, where I'm at, the choices I've made to get here, um, things that are going well, things that are not going as well as I would like them to go. And um, I think it's an important topic for um, a lot of people to kind of talk about. I mean, it, it gets uncomfortable to talk about, you know, any regrets that I might have in, in pursuing this career. Um, but I think it's important for somebody who maybe is interested in pursuing a career in music to hear, um, you know, my answer to this question. And I think it's important for people who aren't as familiar with what a career in music looks like to kind of hear um, a little bit more about this topic. So um, I'm going to kind of talk about some contextual background things around this question because I think it requires a little bit of context and background and understanding of the bigger picture um, to really understand my answer to the question, do I have any regrets on pursuing a career in music? If this is the first time we're meeting, my name is Dr. Natalie Law and I'm a professional bassoonist and bassoon teacher and I love to help students learn how to play the bassoon and get comfortable and feel confident playing this instrument. So if you're not already, I would love if you subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment down below or share it with a friend if you, it's a relevant topic and I'm happy to have you here. So I think that we need to break things down a little bit and talk about the premise of this question. You know, there's a reason that someone might ask this question and or a number of reasons. Um, and there's a lot of nuance to that topic, I think, you know, and I think it helps to understand some contextual reasons for why we would be talking about having regrets in this career field. Um, and I wanna just talk about those and address those, especially for someone who may not be as familiar with um, music as a career. Put simply, a career in music is, is not an easy path for many reasons. There are so many reasons we could talk about how it is difficult to be a full-time professional musician in this, world today. Now, I am speaking from the perspective of living in the United States, grew up here, went to school here, live here currently. I know that that perspective changes in different places in the world. I know that in some places in Europe uh, are very different in terms of how music is viewed and treated as a career. And so my perspective is really just from my own experience of being in the United States. So let me know down in the comments if you're from another country or area or have kind of a different experience. I'd love to know um, more about you and your experience. So in very simple terms, uh, in the field of music, there is very high supply and pretty low demand in terms of sort of regular traditional jobs. So what I mean by that is that there's a high supply of very qualified, very talented musicians who are amazing out there who are looking for and want work. And there is a low demand for those types of musicians in what we might call more traditional standard paths in the career of music. Now I'm going to give you a lot more information on that, but that is kind of like the universal perception of the field of music and it is true in a lot of ways. So pursuing a career in music is difficult because the availability of jobs is pretty low and the competitiveness of jobs is very high. Once you have a job, you know, there's is, you know, there's concerns about job security and there's um, concerns about income potential. Going into any type of art form as a career is not generally a lucrative business. And you have to think that, you know, arts, especially in the United States, those are, uh, we are kind of the first thing that gets cut 
you know, arts programs in schools, arts funding from government agencies are sort of the first things that get cut and they're the things that get trimmed down to, you know, this is just one side of the story. We're talking about, you know, income potential and jobs and all that stuff. But you also have to factor in the fact that the, the costs associated with just getting into the field of music are just astronomical. You, from a young age through college graduates. It's just a huge investment. It's a huge investment of money for sure, but also just time and, and energy. It's such a huge thing to devote your time and life to, to pursue this career. And it's expensive because you basically have to take private lessons if you want to be serious about studying music even before you go into college, you have to have some level of proficiency on your instrument or voice if you're going to study it professionally. And so you have to invest in lessons, you have to invest in instrument. We know that bassoons are incredibly expensive, more so than most other instruments. Unfortunately, we know that the cost of buying and or, or making, maintaining reeds um, and maintaining the equipment is really expensive. I mean, there's just so many costs associated with just getting into the field um, that there, it's just such an investment. And so when you weigh that with the job prospects, you know, that we tend to think about, it's just, it's really depressing and it's really daunting. Um, and that is why a lot of people who are majoring in music in college are stressed out <laughs> because uh, you're not totally sure what you're going to do upon graduation. And so there's, there's definitely a lot to think about in a lot of different areas. So this is where the question comes in about having regrets about a career in music, given all of these difficulties and obstacles just to have a decent quality of life in this career field. And to be clear, a lot of people leave this career field um, at various points for various reasons, but kind of all related back to what I just talked about. There's just a lot of difficulties. And I mean, on top of that, there are difficulties about the schedule as well. I mean, being a musician means that most of the time you're working on nights and weekends and odd hours and not hours that line up with, you know, say other family members. And it's difficult to you know, have a life outside of music when your schedule is often changing and it's often not happening at convenient times from other people. So all of those things, along with the financial stuff and, and just quality of life. So, you know, I've talked about all these difficulties. Um, let me go a little bit more into detail about what, understanding what a career in music can look like, because I think we think about just sort of traditional things like you become a musician and you perform in an orchestra um, you become a musician and you become um, a music teacher of some sort you become a musician and you uh, perform in some capacity for some company or for some organization or some ensemble or something i think that's kind of like that's what people see and there's a lot more that goes into it than just that alone. Um, so let me kind of talk about what all you can do in a career in music. And um, I'll talk a little bit about what I do. And um, hopefully that gives you a better picture. And I'll talk more about the regrets part of things. So we tend to think about a career in music being one of two paths. You can go into music. And if you want to go into classical music, of course, and all this is about classical music, um, sort of the traditional classical music field, you go to school, usually you have to go to some form of grad school. Most people that go into some for form of for performing or teaching end up having at least a master's degree. A lot of us end up with a terminal degree of a, a DMA or a PhD or something. It's typically, you know, there's kind of the, the traditional path of you practice a lot and you take a lot of auditions and you hopefully someday win an orchestral 
job and that's kind of your full-time thing and that's your, your that's your main source of income that's your bread and butter that's your focus that's what you do that's a very traditional um, way and that is uh, becoming less and less common these days and, and more and more difficult to obtain that sort of um, path I think for a lot of people especially when you're getting a graduate degree of some type, especially like a DMA or a PhD degree, usually the other path that's kind of traditional is to teach in higher education, to go become a professor at a university and teach in a music program. Um, and your primary focus is you know, sort, of, sort of in the academic realm um, you may be focused on a, like a research area and just take note that most people who are university professors also do a lot of performing not just at the school and sort of a solo and chamber capacity but a lot of people are expected to and do perform outside of that organization or that institution so just know that you know it's not just teaching it's you know it's, it's always teaching and performing in some capacity and that's pretty common for most musicians there are most of us do some form of performing and some form of teaching some people do more performing and very little if any at all teaching there are some people who do mostly teaching and very little at all actual performing um, a lot of us do some sort of mixture of both so that's it's performing and teaching are kind of the two tracks that you can go on um, in terms of a traditional field. Now, if you're going into music education, you can teach like K-12 music, um, and that's kind of a different path as well. Um, I myself have a music education degree and did student teaching, and I'm certified to teach K-12 music, but it's not the path that I chose to take. So those are kind of sort of traditional things that a lot of people know about. Now, what that actually looks like for a lot of us, most of us are freelancing. So unless you have um, won an audition and you are performing basically full time with like one orchestra and maybe you do some other playing outside of that, maybe you do some festivals or uh, other orchestras and other teaching and stuff, but you maybe have one main gig. So if you're not in that position, um, then typically you're doing what's called freelancing. That means that usually you are hired out by orchestras or, or performing ensembles to perform. Usually it's like a set um, their season that they perform for. Usually they say um, the orchestral season usually runs like kind of along with the school year, like from September to May. That's kind of the bulk of most music performances. And in the summertime, concerts and things usually slow down as people are on vacation and out of school and all of that. So a season for most orchestras and such runs from like September to May and they may book you for, you know, three concerts for the whole season or 10 concerts for the whole season. And they may be, you know, their primary concert series. They may be um, educational outreach series. They, they may have a chamber music series that they're booking you to perform on. Um, you know, it's not just kind of traditional orchestral stuff, but um, there's orchestras that hire musicians out and, you know, uh, a lot of us perform with a lot of different orchestras. So for example, I live in Michigan. I live in a bigger metropolitan area just outside of Detroit. There are a lot more opportunities in this area um, just because of the population size and proximity of things um, and for musicians like me. And I perform with orchestras all over the state. Um, the furthest I drive to to perform is usually about a two hour drive. Most of the orchestras I play with are within an hour drive. So, which I'm pretty lucky because in some places you have to drive a lot more. Um, but for me where I'm at, most of the work that I do, the orchestras that I play with, I I don't have to drive too much. That's actually pretty good for, for most, most places. One week I might be performing with one orchestra, the next week I might be performing with another orchestra in another city, I might be performing with another orchestra the following week, um, I might be playing with the same orchestra you know a couple weeks in a row depending on what's going on. And so that's how kind of like traditional orchestral freelancing works if you are not playing in one major group. 
you're basically a freelancer um, in that capacity. Now, I did have a main sort of full-time position um, when I was the principal bassoon of the Great Falls Symphony out in Montana for a one-year interim position. And that was, you know, sort of my main job. Um, but I definitely did a lot of other playing and teaching outside of that as well. So I've kind of done both sides of it where there is kind of a main thing, a main orchestra or organization that you're working with, um, but I'm still doing a lot of other playing, playing with other orchestras, doing a lot of teaching and that sort of thing. So that's kind of how the freelance playing in the orchestral world goes. And then a lot of us who are, are, are also teaching, we're teaching students, um, a lot of times it's like middle and high school age students, but actually right now I have more adult students than I do um, young students, um, which is thanks to many of you. Many of, of you, my subscribers, have, have chosen to take lessons with me. I love working with both um, young bassoonists and uh, adult bassoonists. In addition to the orchestral freelance performing, you know, that often happens on evenings and weekends, although it can happen during the day as well. There's one orchestra that I play with regularly that will rehearse during the day, but the concerts still happen in the evenings, like at normal concert times. So it really depends on what the orchestra is doing. Some of them work operate on different schedules and all of that. In the area that I live in, because I live in a larger metropolitan area, um, and there's you know more affluent areas within reasonable driving distance, a lot of um, school districts will hire me to come in and work with students. During the school year, I go into uh, middle and high schools in, in the area and I'm hired to work with the bassoon students, either do sectionals or private lessons, um, or just basically help the bassoon students get better. I enjoy doing that and I get to do that with a number of different schools that I work with during the school year. There's three or four schools that I visit on like a weekly basis and then there's a couple schools that I visit on like a bi-weekly or a monthly basis. Um, so I'm regularly visiting these places and some of these students also do take private lessons with me outside of school. So I go in during the school day and then um, they also might take after school lessons with me as well. And I will say that this is less common, but a number of musicians will also perform in chamber settings. Um, so for example, I play in a professional woodwind quintet called Pure Winds. I helped co-found this quintet around six years ago or so and we've been really lucky to perform all over the country and perform in a lot of unique venues and have a lot of unique opportunities and we recently became a nonprofit organization in the last year and which means we're open to more funding opportunities and we're growing and all of these great things and so you know part of my income is from this chamber ensemble that I play with regularly throughout the year. And I am also the executive director of Pure Winds. And so um, I also have a lot of administrative type things that I do for the ensemble in addition to being the bassoonist. Between the orchestral performing and the teaching and, and maybe some chamber performing, that makes up a pretty full freelancing schedule for a lot of us who are able and lucky enough to work um, as close to full time as possible. Now, the interesting thing is that we're not, you know, treated like employees a lot of the time. We are freelance, uh, independent contractors, you know, we are our own business that's being hired out to play, to perform, or to teach um, somewhere, or um, we're hired by students to teach them, you know, so it's a very business type uh, approach. You know, we're not an employee with a salary and benefits, although that can happen um, in the job that I had with the Great Falls Symphony. Um, last year, you know, I had a salary and that would, like I said, that was kind of my main source of income, but definitely not the only thing I did for sure. So a lot of this is about being, a, you're basically a small business owner of yourself. You are um, getting hired out by different companies, essentially orchestras, you're getting hired by potentially schools, you're getting hired by individual students to teach you, you know, you are a business. And I think a lot of people going into the field don't think of it that way or have a hard time wrapping their head around it, but you are basically a small business owner as a freelance 
musician, basically. And I think that's where a lot of the friction comes in because there's a lot of business knowledge, things with taxes and, and staying organized and um, you know making sure that you get paid and all of these things that come along with this line of work um, that are not like being an employee somewhere. I've talked a lot about kind of the traditional past that people think about and people take. And there's something that I haven't addressed yet, which is the ability to own your own business, not just as like sort of a traditional freelancer and hiring yourself out, but also creating more of um, a business that is not just you and, and yourself. Um, and I'm talking just about what this is, building a bassoonist um, here on YouTube and so on. Um, this is a big part of what I do. Um, owning and managing this business. So if you aren't familiar with, with building a bassoonist, um, well, I'm here on YouTube as you're watching. I have a YouTube channel that I teach um, bassoon concepts and I talk about bassoon topics and I try to help people get better at the bassoon and learn things that are you know, difficult to just do a Google search on. Um, and I try to be a good resource for for you basically and so that is a, a big component of my business and you know if you haven't been over been over on my website um, head over there and you'll notice that I sell bassoon reads I make reads my bassoon read orders have really increased recently so I apologize if you've ordered a read from me in the last month or so I am still adjusting to this volume of orders and so i apologize in advance you know because i'm just a one woman show um and so i sell reads i offer private lessons like i said i offer zoom lessons and a lot of you have signed up for zoom lessons with me and i encourage you if you if you're at all interested in a lesson i'd love to to meet with you um and i also have an online course um, for beginning bassoonists from that starts from day one and takes you step by step through basically everything you need to know to get started playing bassoon and, and getting a good foundation to your playing. And all of this started as kind of a side project when I was in school and um, I eventually wrapped it into my dissertation for my DMA. So there was an academic component to it. Um, but I've grown to love this business. This is really one of my favorite things that I do um, with you all is is this. I, I love to, I love teaching and I love teaching in this capacity and I love connecting with people that I would otherwise not have any connection with. Um, so please, you know, keep, keep reaching out. You know, this is, community is growing and more and more of you are reaching out to me with questions and comments and things like that. And I don't have as much time to respond as I did, you know, a while ago, um, you know, which is, it's a good problem to have that building a bassoonist is growing. Um, but it just goes to show that there are opportunities in this field that if you're creative and persistent enough that um, there are other things that you can do besides just sort of the traditional career paths. And I think that's where a lot of people don't see that or don't realize that or, or realize how big of a deal it is. And I think part of it is because when you go into school, bachelor's, master's, DMA, um, college, higher education, they focus on the traditional stuff. Um, a lot of programs are getting more sort of entrepreneurial business um, into their curriculum, but it's still not sort of a core concept. And it's so funny because as musicians, we are business owners, basically. We are we are a business. And so um, having business skills like marketing and um, finances and all of the things that go into running a business um, are really, really important no matter what path you end up taking. It's so important to know all of those things. Um, there are lots of people, there are bassoonists specifically who are like me and they have excellent reed making businesses and they uh, sell other things online and they do interesting things with their teaching and all of this stuff um, people do that are unique and interesting and that sector of the career field in music is growing and I think it's becoming more and more normalized and viable and so I think that is the part that you know needs to come out more and needs to be known a little bit more um, when we're talking about this career field is we talk about all the negatives, but there are some really unique opportunities um, 
that are, can be self-created um, when you are when you are creative. So, do I have any regrets about following this career path? Um, I don't. I don't think it's hard to say because yes, it would be great, you know, um, if if I had an amazing, stable job with an amazing salary and I had everything I wanted, you know, like if if I you know I, I sometimes think about that, but in the end, I'm also like this is the thing that I'm you know and passionate about and invested in and have spent most of my life um, trying to be better at. And um, you know I want I might say maybe I would have done some things differently, certainly. Maybe I wish I would have done more maybe business, maybe I would have gotten a business degree or um, gotten more business experience because that's what I deal with in my day to day is kind of like, how do I manage a business? So yes, I think that everything that I've done up to this point has gotten me to where I am, all the experiences, you know, for example, I have a music education degree and although I didn't go into full-time classroom teaching, I think I learned so much from that experience of learning how to teach and getting some classroom teaching experience and things that didn't necessarily directly relate to what I'm doing now. I think that I still gain things from them. So I, it's hard for me to say, you know, do I regret things? Because I think a lot, everything that's happened has led me to where I am and things that haven't gone well, I've, I've learned from. And I tend to be an optimistic person when it comes to that. And, you know, I tend to think that, you know, when you put in effort, um, just like when you're trying to learn bassoon, uh, when you when you put in the effort, you put it, put in the blood, sweat and tears, so to speak, you you reap the benefit. Yeah, like I said, it's not always what I would want it to be. Um, but I also think that um, it, it is a lot of what I want it to be. And, um, and I'm, I know that in other career fields. I know not just in music, a lot of people in other career fields have regrets about that career. It's not just music. I mean, obviously music has its own difficulties and, and unique things that we deal with, but other career fields also have unique things. Maybe you're, you know, making a great salary and there's great job stability, but you hate your schedule or you don't, you're not a fan or you're not fully invested in what you're doing. Um, so there's always that trade off for sure. Um, and I, I have to say that I, I don't regret where, I, where I'm at. I don't think I have any really big regrets. Maybe some, I wish I could have done this differently or done this, added this to, or maybe I would have taken this, you know, direction or I wouldn't have done this or whatnot. But for the most part, I, I'm pretty happy with where I'm at and I'm happy to be here talking to you and sharing my experience with you and learning from you. Um, and I hope to continue doing so. So I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, I know that maybe there's some professional musicians in my audience who I'm sure you have your own uh, things to say about this topic and I would love to know your take on it. You know, let me know down in the comments, what has your experience been? Do you have regrets? What do you like? What do you don't like? Um, you know, and also what questions do you have? <laughs>